Continuing, please welcome Igor Grishechka. So, Yegor is a software engineer with six years' experience. His passion is distributed systems, but he also likes to mobile development and sometimes builds Android applications. Uh, he likes clean code and sure that computer science is one of the most important things in development process. If you have some IT related mascots, you can share with Igor because he likes it very much and his collection is very big. So please welcome and Igor will talk us about the uh, internals of Go channels. Hello everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Igor and uh, currently I work as a software engineer for a brand new blockchain startup that is called InSolar. And we are creating a brand new blockchain, blockchain system there. And because our system is, comp uh, is a blockchain, it works in a completely distributed in an asynchronous way. And because of that, we use channels and go routines and other concurrent stuff in our daily routine a lot. So today I want to speak with you about internals of Go channels and uh, show you the magical world of uh, their source code. So let's start and uh, let me show you a quick agenda of today's talk. So we will start with quick definition of channels. I assume that you have some basic knowledge of uh, channels primitive and of course I assume that you know something about mutexes, locking and stuff like that. But Definition of something is a great start point to discuss something and to explain something. Then we will speak a bit about boring theory, just because boring theory is a great thing. And then we will continue our journey through the land of eternals, internals, and we will end our journey, uh, our journey in the land of internals and stuff like that. So let's start. This screenshot is a direct quote to the tour of Go, and uh, usually when you are searching for some, for some stuff about Go, you usually see this screenshot first, and we can see that we can put something to the channel, we can read something from the channel, of course we can create it, and also I'm sure that there is a page about closing channels, but, okay, I assume this. And, uh, but it's a boring, boring theory. Let's create a real world example. Everyone who has a cat knows that cats are always hungry. So I create a real world example because feeding a cat is an asynchronous uh, way of interaction with cat. Uh, <clears throat> I create some food. It's just a string. I created a channel, this type of string. And then in my main function, I, I'm calling for a synchronous go routine. In, in this function, I'm putting some food to the plate. And in the end of the function, hungry cat is waiting for the food. And of course, when we start to execute this example, we will see something like that. It's an expected result and nothing wrong with it. So. And uh, le le let's make a quick, quick characteristic of Go channel at what it can do. So usually Go channel shares data between Go routines. Also, it's a Go routine safe primitive. So we don't bother with synchronization. We don't bother with mutexes and other stuff. We just use them in different Go routines, and that's all. Also, it works in a first in first out way. So it. Uh, works like a queue, we, and we are guaranteed in order of execution go routines that are wo uh, wanting to put something to the channel or reading something from the channel. And uh, also it, it can block and unblock go routines. And sometimes it seems to us like it's a pure magic because we have so simple API, just four methods like putting something to the channel, reading something from the channel, creating channel and closing channel. But it's so complex and we can see that there are some edge cases like blocking, like reading and stuff like that. And if you don't know how channel works, it seems like a pure magic. But uh, I hope in the end of my talk you will know that there is no magic in Go, at least in the area of channels. So when I started to investigate the question, I started uh, to search for the point of truth, I asked myself only one question, why? Why this primitive happened to go? And I found this, uh, the answer, and it's called communicating sequential processes. And what is that? It's a quote to Wikipedia, and it's a, some kind of paradigm that describes patterns of interaction in concurrent systems. And uh, there are some uh, pillars of this paradigm. 
and they sound like they sound like each process is created for sequential execution. Hello, go routines. Processes communicate through channels, not by sharing memory state. Hello, channels. And uh, we scale through spamming new instances of the processes. Hello, go routines again. And uh, this stuff influenced many languages, include Go, because okay, we have Go routines, we have channels, we communicate through channels, not by sharing uh, of memory and state, and so on. So I continued my journey, and, and I found this beautiful video. You can watch it, and I uh, recommend you to watch it because it's a bit, it's a bit theoretic, but it, it will cover and it's covered some po uh, topics that I won't cover during my talk, and uh, it's it's a really cool video. And after watching this video, I started to watch on the source code, and I was astounded because. Before I started programming with Go, I had been told that there is no syntax sugar in Go. Almost there is no syntax sugar in Go, like it's straightforward, error checking, and all the stuff. But I saw complex and big syntax sugar, and it was called, and it is called channels. Yeah, channels is just a syntax sugar about a bunch of methods and structs inside of Go runtime and source code. And uh, to tell the truth, there is uh, three main structs uh, that helps that help Go channels uh, to work. First of them is HN. It's uh, these structs. Uh, this struct contains uh, the most important fields uh, that are needed for working mechanism of channels. Second one is a pseudo G. If you don't know, it's G is a representation of Go routine in source code of Go. And pseudo G is some kind of superset of G because it contains some additional fields that it's needed for working mechanism. Uh, I will talk about all these structs in the next slides. And the last struct is wait Q, and it's just a linked list of Go routines that are waiting for reading something or writing something from the channel and to channel. And we will, we will talk about this <coughs> struct too. And there are a few methods, of course. It's a make chan. Okay, when we, you create channel, you just, you just calling for this function. Channel send. Of course, it's obvious what, what it does. It, uh, it's, it's about when you're sending something to channel, you're just calling for this function. Channel receive, the same situation, but about receiving something from the channel. And close function. I have no idea what this function does. Okay, okay, I have. And uh, let's start. And I want to say that there are some additional structs and methods, but we will take a quick glance on them during the talk. So let's start with the HN struct. What is that? Let's imagine we want to create just a channel with capacity three and uh, this type of string. And I want to add that uh, during next few slides, I will talk about buffer channels and not uh, in happy passes. And I won't speak about H cases like writing or reading from unbuffered channel or writing to the buffered channel with full buffer because uh, we need to understand some basic concepts, and after that, we will start to speak about edge cases. So, when we start to execute this code, uh, HN struct is created. What is that? It's a struct with a lot of fields, but there are four the most important fields inside of it. It's a buffer. What is a buffer? Buffer, it's a buffer. It's a circle queue of data that you want to put to the channel or read from the channel. And it's a circle queue. Usually, cir circle queue is implemented in the way like an array with two pointers, uh, with reading pointer and sending pointer. And when you go uh, out of range of your capacity, you just move your pointer to the zero. The same situation about, uh, we can see the same situation here. So we have two, two indexes, sending index and receiving index. And of course, we have a log. And when I saw this log, it answered all, all my question about log free programming in Go. Because if you don't see any problems with your code in benchmarks, I suppose you shouldn't be worried with cast loops, log free programming, and stuff like that, because because you have logs inside your channels, and you ch you use channels everywhere, and runtime uses channels everywhere, and uh, so if you don't have benchmarks and uh, um, going to think that your <coughs> 
code isn't good enough and is slow, you should at least start to do some benchmarking. So when let's imagine we want to put something to the channel, what will happen? We check for the send, uh, send index, put the element to, the, to this index, and just increment send index. The same situation about second element and the third element. And as I told you, when our buffer is full, we just uh, move our send index to the zero. And when we want to read from the channel, we just check for the receive index, uh, read the element, and then increment receive index. And that's all. And an interesting situation, like I told you, that currently our send index uh, points to the zero, and we can write something to the channel. So uh, next question I asked my, myself was, where is, is it stored? Because it's an important question, because we don't bother with uh, copying channels and stuff like that. And answer in this function. Because if you concentrate your attention in the result of the function, you can see a small star <laughs> near HN. And this is an answer, because when we create channel, we create uh, HN struct on the heap. And then we just iterate with it uh, through pointer. And this is the answer again for uh, interacting with uh, channels through functions, with passing channels through channels of channels, stuff like that. Because we just work with the pointers that uh, point to the struct on the heap. So, so let's start with the more detailed investigation of our HN struct. And the first field is a queue count. It's a, this field uh, holds data, uh, holds amount of the elements in our buffer. So, for example, if we have uh, some channel, buffer channel, for example, with capacity five, and we have three elements uh, inside of it, uh, this uh, field start to hold three. Second number, it's a uh, size of our buffer. So if we create a channel with capacity 5, these fields start to hold 5. Uh, when we start, we, we talked about this field before, and it's just a buffer, a buffer and uh, it wor it represented by unsafe pointer, and there are some helper methods that help us to work with that, but you will show, you will show everything about them during the demo. And next field is a bit tricky because it's an element size and uh, it holds size of the element and when you create type of strings, it holds size of the string. When you create the <coughs> channel of bulls, it holds uh, size of the bull and stuff like that. Next field, it's my favorite field because it leads us to my favorite panic. It's some kind of like close on close channel. And uh, this is the reason for it because when you close in channel, you just uh, make closed field, uh, closed field uh, points to one. Or when your closed field <coughs> holds zero, it means that your channel is open. Next field is uh, some kind of representation of generics in Go, because we can say that channel some kind of generics because we can create channels of different types, but it's still a syntax sugar because when you create channels of string, you j just create a chain and uh, element size starts to hold size of string and element type starts to hold pointer to the type of string and that's all. And I can say that slices uh, work in the similar way. They're using the element type two and element size, but it's a bit different. We talked about send index, so it's a send index in our circle queue. We talked about receive index. It's a um, index in our queue. Uh, and then we, you can see a bit advanced field, as I told you. It's a linked list of goroutines that are waiting for uh, receiving from the channel. So let's imagine an example. We have unbuffered channel, or we have unbuffered buffer channel with empty buffer. In this example, when uh, some goroutine uh, goes to us and asks something like, hey, I want to read from the channel, and we have nothing to send to it, 
it uh, would be added to receive queue and uh, would be waiting for the some data and stuff like that. And it's just a linked list. The same situation about sending queue. Just because it's a linked list of goroutines that are waiting for sending something, for putting something to the channel and it, they have no ability to do this because, j just because. And my favorite field is mutex and it's, it's called log, and big comment like we are using log to protect all fields in HN and stuff like that. So they are using mutex for locking fields in, in when, they, uh, when the channel is called from different goroutines. <sighs> Sounds complicated, yeah? And do you remember that at least we have four the most famous and important IP, public API points uh, and ways to interact with channels. It's like sending, reading, creating, and closing, but it's only one struct. Let's go further. Let's take a quick look on the HN struct again, and let's start with the receive queue linked list and send queue linked list too. As I told you, wait queue struct is a bit advanced because it holds um, pointers to the head of the linked list and the <coughs> tail of the linked list. And when we, and because it holds pointers, and as I told you, sudo g is a superset of g, it holds some additional information that it's needed for working process of channel. So we have g inside, it's a pointer to g, so no, mem no memory copy here. We have uh, is select bool flag that it's needed for select stuff. And we, uh, and we have next uh, and previous pointers to the next to the G and previous to the G just because it's to the G's. Element is a pointer to the element that you want to write it or to read from. So it's like if you um, write some string to the channel, uh, this element, this string will be uh, saved in the element. And also we have a circle reference to a chain. And to tell the truth, I hate circle reference because last year you, uh, we spent about four months in our project to fight with uh, circle reference. And when I saw circle reference inside Sudo G, it was like, okay, you're great in that. Uh, good job. And then let's start with the quick example. Again, let's imagine we have a new pet and it's a dog. And of course, sometimes people like, uh, like uh, cats more than dogs. We want to, uh, but we have only one plate. And we want to feed cat and dog from one plate. We call them for the plate, and then we put some stuff inside it. And when you can uh, mention that there is no buffer in this uh, channel. So, when we start to register go routines with this channel, the same uh, the situation like that will happen in the runtime. So our, uh, our receive queue <coughs> uh, is uh, starts to start starts to be fooled with additional elements. So we register cat function. It it would be put it in the first element that it would be stored. Uh, its pointers to the previous and next elements uh, would be pointed to the new. And when we called for the uh, next function, in our case it's dog, uh, we would point next element to the dog, our previous element of dog will be pointed to the cat and stuff like that, and we have nils because it's a tail and the head, and that's all. But there is an interesting point with that. Because when I read, uh, <coughs> started to execute this code for the first time, I saw this result. And I asked myself why, <laughs> why this happened. And uh, the answer is that we can't, we aren't guaranteed in the order of registering goroutines in our runtime. So we are guaranteed in the order of execution goroutines because it's a linked list, but we aren't guaranteed in the order of registering these goroutines in the linked list. So uh, go runtime and go, uh, go scheduler is a, another area full of magic and it's a big complex and it's a theme for another topic, much more complex than mine. 
But I found the solution. It's like it's the best decision because if you don't know what to do with uh, some asynchronous code and have some trouble, troubles, just add some sleep and okay, it's working right now. Sometimes we debug our and we write our test with these patterns because our CI make our life makes our life a bit tricky. So and in this case we will get something like that. So let's start with the demo and uh, watch this code on the real world examples. And uh, we just, sorry, one moment. Okay, we just have a simple function. It has, and we have nothing inside it. So let's go to the land of channel, and this file is channel.go, and it uh, it's stored in the SRC runtime folder. And here is it. Here is the land of channels. And first, I want to point your attention on more, on very interesting flag that is called debug channel. Usually, it points to false, and when you start to program it with Go, it points to false. But if you set it to true, and then you run, you start to execute your program, you can see an interesting output, something like that. You have just an empty function, just calling for it, but at least you have two channels in your runtime. I spent some time for investigating uh, what are these channels, and one channel is using by uh, garbage collection, and another channel is using for some sh scheduling work, and uh, you can you can see it without any problems because Go is open source. So let's go further. As I told you, we have H instruct with the same fields. I told you the truth. We have a wait queue struct, and that's all. And so for us, it's time to start with uh, investigating some methods. So let's start with make chain function. So when you call for the function you, for creating a channel, you just call for this method. And as I, as I told you, it returns pointer to the H chain. It has some checking for the size of the channel before its creation. And also it has an interesting stuff inside of it. So at least there are three types of channel and uh, in, in the term of creation them. So when you create a channel of empty structs, you go to the first branch. When you go, when you create a channel of pointers, you go to the second branch and uh, other stuff go to the third branch. And then we just, uh, because uh, C is a chain, we just adding some data like element size, like element, data size, and stuff like that. And as I told you, print in the end of the function, and that's all. Let's go further to the sending from the channel. And uh, when you send to the channel with different uh, position, or you read from different points of view, like you read with two variables, or you send with one variables, you're just calling for different methods, and uh, at least there is one uh, generic method for sending and reading from channel. So. Let's start about sending from channel. And the most interesting part, one of the two most, uh, most interesting parts of this method in the start of it. So this is the answer why, why you see the panic when you, sorry, why uh, you block in forever when you try to send something to a new channel. So when your channel is new, and uh, block is a variable that is used for select. I won't cover it because select topic is a big and complex. I will show you the code in the few minutes. But there are some stuff between channels that it needed for select, but it's a complex stuff and I won't cover it. And uh, if our channel is new, we just park in our GoRoutine. GoPark is a special method of runtime that park in GoRoutine and this GoRoutine will be waiting for something. And we just park our GoRoutine and that's all. We won't reach this GoRoutine forever and it's, it's just waiting for something. And it won't give any answers in the future. Then debug chain, race enabled for my favorite race detection. 
some, some interesting stuff about checking for blocking for not taking locks. And then uh, some interesting stuff with receiving. We have at least two areas of receiving something from channel. So the first one, when we have some, something in our receive queue. And there is an interesting situation about receiving something from the uh, go routines that are in the waiting queue. It's, it, this is the method that, that is called send direct. And when you have a go routine in the receive queue or send queue, and in this case, uh, about uh, this case is about receive queue. When you have a go routine inside receive queue, and another go routine goes and something like, "Hey, I get the data, data," it just writes to the stack of waiting go routine. And as I know, this is only one uh, place in go runtime when one go routine uh, is writing to the stack of another go routine. It's an interesting stuff, like some interesting methods. So. Uh, if we have some go routines in the receiving queue, we just write into them. In other case, we just doing a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, sorry. If we have something to the buffer, we read from the buffer. And uh, in other stuff, we just uh, park our go routine again and it's just waiting for something. If we just put it to the, one moment, I will show you. We just put it to the send queue. It will uh, be it will waiting for something, and j just all. Let's start with the uh, close chain function and the same situation here. If you, our channel is new, we just throw panic, and this is simple. And this is answer why we, we see sometimes uh, close on close channel. Oh, sorry, it's a close on nil channel. Um, next, we start to work with our HN, we take log, and then check for the closed flag. And if it's closed, we throw panic again, and it's like closed on closed channel, yay. And in the end of the function, we just release of the receive queue, receive go routines, saying, and we are saying to them like, you're free right now. And the same stuff about sending go routines, but there is a small difference like, when you release uh, sending queue, all the goroutines will be blow up. Uh, I suppose you know it. And next interesting me methods is a uh, channel receive because it's it's receiving from channel. This is the answer why receiving from new channel is about blocking uh, blo blocking calling goroutine forever just because we checking for the new channel and then park our goroutine. Same stuff with checking. Same stuff with some additional stuff, checking for closed channel. This is uh, a piece of code that shows us uh, th that we can read from channel when it's closed, but we are returning buffer, and then we start to return default, uh, default values. This stuff is about getting something from the sending queue, and the same stuff here about send from the stack one go routine to the stack another go routine. So in this case, we just read from the stack of sending go routines and putting to the receiving go routine. The same stuff about checking uh, buffer of the channel, and uh, it's like we are adding. If we have no data, no sending go routines and stuff like that, we just putting something to the receive queue and wait for the result. <coughs> And as I told you, uh, there is an interesting uh, file that is called select go. It <laughs> also have a debug select flag, and it's a complex stuff. It's much more bigger than channels, and there are some interesting stuff like cast loops here, randoms, and some, something like that, because there is fast run here. And uh, it's a big next sim, but you can watch it with yourself. So. Um, um, there is one more interesting point that I want to talk with you about. It's uh, using empty structs. Why empty struct is just a special case? One, why when you need to use hash set, you just need, you just use a map with uh, of empty structs. Just because when you create something of empty structs, it has element size zero and it has no additional infos in the internals. And it's like when you create channel of empty structs, 
you just create machinery and there is no additional information in the internal structs. It's, I can say the same about bulls, ins, and all the stuff because, because at least some additional info will be added. As you saw, there are some tricky parts inside of the Go channels. But at least I want to tell you that Go channels is a perfect example of great API. We have only four methods, public methods and well-known methods to interact with them. So we can create it, we can close it, we can read it, we can put something to it. But we have so complex machinery behind them and we don't bother it with them at all. It just works. And because of that, it's just a great example of great API. And as you saw, there is no magic in channels. It's just a complex machinery behind the simple MPI. In the end of the talk, I, would, I want to show you a great table of the channels because sometimes it helps me. It's like if I have no idea what will happen when I do something with nil channel or closed channel or not, not nil channel or something like that, it helps me very well. And uh, it's a cool table, and I uh, also can recommend you read some, some stuff about channel from go101.org. It's a great source of some internal knowledge, and it's a great start point to start to investigate something, and then after reading it, you just go to the source code and see some interesting stuff. This is the list of articles that I, use, that I, I was using during the preparation, and if you read all, all the stuff, you also will know some stuff about Select Tool. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please ask some questions. Um, what brought you to actually open the sources and read inside the channel implementation? What was the root cause that brought you to do that? You know, there are two uh, reasons for this. The first one is my personal reason. I like to know how things uh, work. In some libraries and stuff like that, I just watch you know, how they work and getting some interesting ideas. The second one, uh, we came to our project from different language. If uh, maybe, I am talking about my working place currently, and uh, for maybe 80% uh, percent of my colleagues go isn't native language and my current project is the first proje uh, project uh, is really completely in Go. And I started to investigate the internals to give some answer to my co colleagues to, to make them to make them understand better the internals and how channels work because I was sitting in, my, in the company's office and, and heard a lot of magic and a lot of things about channels like, oh my God, channels can do that, channels can do that and something like that. So I, I, I needed to do this. More questions? Igor, can I ask you in Russian? It's a unique opportunity. Ну, никто не хочет значок или все 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 знали? Нету никаких вопросов. Ну, хорошо. Окей, so let's make some applause for Igor. Thank you. Thank you.